there! Welcome to Series Shorts. I'm Ipsy, and today we are discussing chapters 11 through 13 of A Discovery of Witches, written by Deborah Harkness. If you haven't seen the first two series shorts on this novel, go ahead and check those out for context. I'll have the first one linked down below, as well as the 38-minute deep dive video that I made in case you want a little more information or would just like to listen to me read to you for a little bit. Fair warning, there will be spoils ahead. I do not hold back on these series shorts, so strap in. Diana has difficulty sleeping through the night after Jillian's revelation about her parents and her encounter with Knox. When she goes to the library the next day, she's greeted by Miriam. Matthew hasn't returned her call, and he's not in the library. When he does show up later that day, the vampire and witch agree to talk later, knowing Knox is probably listening in on their conversation. On the way to yoga, Diana admits to Matthew that she's been using magic far more than she realized, and that discovery scares her. Despite her best efforts, her magical abilities have wormed their way into her life. Wishing she could spend more time with Matthew, she invites him over for dinner. She makes him a few dishes that revolve mainly around nuts, raw meat, and berries, taking cues from wolves' diets in order to feed the vampire, which turns out to be a good instinct. Matthew thoroughly enjoys the meal. They discuss they they discuss other foods that Matthew can eat, as well as the inac as well as the inaccuracy about of common legend. <laughs> Never gonna get through it. They discuss other foods that Matthew can eat, as well as the inaccuracy of common legends that revolve around vampires. Diana also discovers that Matthew is more than 1,500 years old. When she gets up the courage to ask him about 1859, the year that Knox mentioned, he tells her that that's when he read Origin for the first time, and how it spurred in him an interest to find out more about creature evolution. Matthew's honesty is rewarded when Diana explains to him what she saw when she opened Ashmole 782. He invites Diana to the lab the next day so that he can better explain why he's so interested in the magical manuscript. While they're there, Matthew explains to Diana that they've been studying creature genetics and, through their research, have come to the conclusion that creatures are going extinct. Vampires are losing the ability to sire, demons are more and more prone to madness, and witches are losing their power. Diana decides to contribute her own blood to the research, not only because she comes from a long line of witches, but because she's also curious about what sort of powers her parents may have passed on to her. That was a lot of peas. I hope that wasn't too punchy. After another round of yoga class, Matthew walks Diana to her rooms and asks if she would be willing to join him for a second dinner date. So, how did this section of the book compare to its TV show adaptation? I'm afraid it's about to get a bit confusing. See, the TV show has to move around a lot of these plot points because our main characters in the TV show are barely cordial with each other. They can't have Diana asking Matthew out right when he gets back from Scotland. Not after the way that things were left with him sniffing her sweater all weird. He does give it back, by the way. He puts it in her mail cubby at the college, and Diana seems pleasantly surprised by the gesture, so that's something. When Diana discovers Jillian's betrayal, she goes to Matthew's rooms to explain the situation. He initially seems disinterested in her predicament until she expresses that she has no desire to ever let Knox get his hands on Ashmole 782. This prompts Matthew to show Diana his copy of Origin to explain that he's been looking for the manuscript since then, that he thinks it will help explain creature origin. It's then that Matthew invites Diana to his lab and explains the work they're doing on creature genetics and why they think creatures are going extinct. After Matthew's candidness, Diana then tells him what she knows about Ashmole 782, and he thanks her with a kiss on her wrist, which is great. We're finally getting some badly needed chemistry between the characters. The next day, with the library full of creatures, Matthew offers to take Diana on a drive to the old lodge. He has some alchemy books there she might be interested in. She's much more likely to get research done in the privacy of Matthew's library than in the one full of other creatures. During her perusing of his manuscripts, Matthew realizes that Diana's magic, while out of control, comes out of her when she needs something. It's connected to her need, and that's why she was able to call up Ashmole 782, why she was able to get it. Diana says it must be more than that, and Matthew agrees. There's some other connection between her and Ashmole 782. All of this, by the way, isn't revealed in the book until much 
much later. Matthew tells Diana how old he is, and then she asks him to come over for dinner. So yeah, the plot points get moved around a lot to make the dinner invite make more sense. It works out. I mean, I would have preferred the characters got more time to fall for each other, but I think I've already expressed that opinion plenty by this point. I do really like the way they handled the lab scene. It's one of my favorites, and they did an excellent job of adapting it in the TV show. Obviously, there's a second dinner coming in the book, and we haven't even got our first with our lovebirds in the TV show, but that will all have to wait until episode four. I hope you enjoyed this series short. Feel free to leave a comment or hit the like button, and I look forward to seeing you next time.